In this chapter, we're going to focus on arrays. So my intent is to show you single-dimensional arrays, two-dimensional arrays, three-dimensional arrays, spiraling arrays, radial arrays. Um, and uh, I've done a little bit of this already here and there scattered throughout the videos. And I've done a little bit of instancing. I've done a little bit of duplicating uh, with the duplicate special feature. I'm going to go over some of that content with you right now. The, the whole point of this entire section, and actually the next two, is to focus on uh, being able to control hundreds of objects uh, through instancing and through maybe some mail script eventually, and just to get a better control over managing a large amount of objects in a scene. So to get this started, I want to go back to a very simple uh, setup, which is the duplicate special, uh, not duplicate special, the duplicate and duplicate with transform, which is found under your edit menu. So let's take a look at that. So to use duplicate and duplicate with transform properly, I'm going to start the cube off with a simple duplication, the control D, and then transform it. And so the duplicate with transform, what it'll do is it'll take the last transform that I just did and apply it to the next one. So when Shift D, it simply repeats that last thing that I did. So taking a look at that again from the beginning, if I say duplicate and then I move it and then I scale it and then do that Shift D, not only do I get the transformation, but I'm also getting a change in scale. All right, so then let's say we did something like a duplicate and then we had a little bit of translation and then actually let's make this really cool uh, I'm gonna move the center to one of the top points here and then hit insert again and then I'll duplicate and snap by transforming I'll snap to that location I won't do anything else I'll rotate a little on the X nothing else and then I'll scale down just a little bit like that and now when I hit uh, shift D it's repeating the transformation It's repeating the rotation it's repeating the scale in a linear fashion right on down the line and so, you know, I, I wouldn't say that that's the best way to make this object. I can think of a lot of uh, other very sophisticated ways to make this. But if you were looking for some simple uh, uh, decoration that you wanted to add to a logo or you simply needed a static image or you just needed something with previs that had this level of detail, um, that duplicate transform which is very simple could work out very very well for you um, so let's trash that it's no good um, and let's talk about um, two-dimensional so uh, well actually let's let's go back to that let's use this for the two-dimensional so if I wanted to repeat all of this and say um, duplicate it and then translate it and then I could hit shift D I could then get multiples of this piece so now it's starting to look interesting um, that's a bit interesting so let's say delete that what if we took all of this stuff and then we grouped it control G so now we've got some good management and then I could say maybe move that group to a new location so let's say I hit the insert key for this group and then I translate that uh, maybe to the bottom corner so I'll hold down V and snap it and then hit insert again uh, that's the home key on a Macintosh um, insert again and uh, now when I do my duplication now when I duplicate the whole group and I do some let's say rotation this time so I want to rotate around around that point something like that I don't know I can't think of anything better and then shift D you know that's what I end up with now I guess it's kinda neat um, so you can come up with some 
relatively sophisticated looking things uh, with a very few, very few tools. Just a little bit of planning, a little bit of pivot point management, and off you go. Um, let's get rid of that. So simple, simple 1D, 2D, 3D arrays would be as simple as something like this, and then move it to the side, and then something like this, and then take all of that, and duplicate it again, and then something like this. Um, all done. Now the problem with all of this is that it's not um, it's not instanced, uh, meaning that each one is individual. So unless your intent is to make each object independent from the last, that means every one of these objects either either you apply a material to each one or you select them all and apply the same material to it, or you could simply have each one of these objects sharing the same sh same shape node from the from the original. So let's take a look at how to do that using the duplicate special tool. Let's delete all this stuff and delete those groups that were created. Um, get another cube and this time I'll go to the edit duplicate special option box and in here let me go to edit reset. These are the default settings of the duplicate special options. Um, what we're looking for is an instance. Uh, copy is the same as when I duplicate something. So it just gives you a, a new shape node um, in addition to the transform node when you duplicate the object. Um, and, and just so that you're clear that you know what I'm talking about when I say shape node and whatnot, um, if I go here to hypergraph connections, you can see that the object cube is actually made of a couple of pieces. Um, so here's the cube in its standard hierarchy all by itself. And then if you in investigate the cube, you have the cube shape object, and then you have the cube transform node. And the shape is tied to the shading group or the shader that's applied to it. That's the, the color and the textures that it looks like. This polycube object, that's simply, that is simply, where is it? That is this polycube one um, uh, parameters right here where, we, where you change the look of the cube but if you select this cube and went to edit delete by type and freeze the history delete the history all you're left with now is the transform node which is this stuff here in the channel box the uh, translate rotate scale visibility stuff like that the shader which is in the attribute editor is this tab the initial shading group uh, that one right there the Lambert and and then you're left with the shape node. So when we instance stuff, it's instance it the instances are connected to the same shape node. So if I just temporarily close that for a moment, come back over here to duplicate special and instance, uh let's make just two and let's translate them on the z axis negative two. So I'm gonna have two more cubes and they're gonna move to every two units down the negative Z. Remembering this is the X column, the Y column, and the Z column. Okay, so when I investigate this in the hypergraph connections now, notice that P cube shape is connected with three lines going to the initial shading group. Well, that's because I've got three different objects sharing it. So this one shares it as well. And if I select all three, notice that when I bring all three cubes, when I hit this little hierarchy button right here, when I bring all three cubes into the hypergraph connections uh, window, uh, I can see the transform nodes for each instance. So each instance has its own independent transformations. So I can move them independently of each other. But they all share the same shape node, which means when I go here to face and I select the face, they all share the same faces, the same shape. So there are some serious advantages to this. And a couple of bugs too, but mostly advantages. So let's get that cube, get a duplicate special again, and this time to properly build this piece, let's say I did a row of five, negative two on the Z axis, I'll hit apply. I'm hitting apply so that this window stays open, but apply is also a way to make these last settings stay in this, uh, uh, to stay here the next time you open up the duplicate special option box. Um, 
then let's select all of those cubes and then we'll move them in the uh, negative x direction so we'll say negative 2 in that direction and but no but none in the z direction this time five more for a five by five or I'm sorry for a total of six by six because I already had one so one row plus five more um, and then let's take that and say uh, five again and this time we'll say none on the x-axis but two up on the y-axis and there we go it t took a second to generate it but now I've got a five deep five wide and uh, sorry six deep six wide and six high and they're all connected so you can see here when I double click the faces of one of the cubes I am in fact double uh, getting the faces for all of the cubes so translating on X or the Z or the Y has the has the effect of moving them all at the same time um, and if I were to say um, yeah select all the faces and rotate them they rotate in their local space around that center and scaling as well so uh, and, and of course I could do other things too um, like like I could um, say go here to the side view no front view and what if I did something interesting like I drew a CV curve and I don't know if this will work actually and no it should work because I'm gonna change one of them so they all should change so let's say I took that face and I extrude it along that curve um, and I give it uh, a couple of divisions where are the divisions right there and I extrude it yeah so they all get it so it's gonna propagate to all of them um, so that has its uses so let's talk about uh, radial and spiral since you've got one down 1d 2d and 3d down and let's do um, a radial array so let's get a, a cube again and this time I'll show you the the simplest way of doing this that was uh, select all the vertices of this cube and I want to make a, a, a circle of these cubes so I'm gonna select all the vertices of this cube and move them to the side maybe even snap them to a specific unit and when I hit uh, when I when I go to object mode and I select the object again notice that the center of the cube is right here at the origin so that means when I rotate this cube it's actually going to rotate around that pivot point so you can imagine that as I duplicate these it's going to spin around and give me several around that origin so let's do that. So if I go here to edit and duplicate special option box, let's just leave this open. Um, let's see here. Instances, yes. Uh, do I want to translate on the y-axis? No, I don't. And I want to spin around on the y-axis. So that's the green axis. I want it to spin and live on the x and z plane. So that means, and I want to have maybe uh, 10 of them. So I've got one, so I only need nine more and so 10 divided into 360 degree rotation is easy math so with the cube selected I'll hit apply and I'm gonna have uh, now I have 10 uh, instances around so this is interesting because if I wanted all of these cubes to be touching each other I would have to like do some kind of math to figure out the length of the cube and then how much uh, given given the uh, given the circumference of the circle, like what is the length of the cord and how many do I need in order to, I don't have to calculate any of that stuff actually. I, I can use instances to my advantage by selecting a face on this side of the box and on this side of the box, and then I can scale them away from each other until the until the uh, cubes touch, and that's the length of the cord. So that's it for ten pieces. So it's pretty nice. Um, and then I could also go right here to Vertex, grab those, and even scale those apart, you know, to seal it off. So if I wanted some kind of, some kind of well or some kind of um, campfire circle or something. There's a smarter way of doing this, and I think uh, better in the long run. And that is to have your cube grouped from the beginning. So take the, with the cube here, Control-G, group it. So now we've got a group in a cube so we've got a parent and a child so we're going to take advantage of parent child relationship here parent child space so the child is uh, freely able to move within on its own local axis so I can move it within its parent space but it has to go with its parent meaning that when I move the group the cubes gonna go with the group so with that in mind I can then take the group and rotate it but then preserve the transformations of the cube, meaning 
that I'll be able to uh, translate the cube according to its object, uh, its its local space and its parent space. Excuse me, uh, in and out towards the the uh, the parent. So it's the parent that's actually going to get the thir thirty six degree transformation on it, but the cube itself uh, has. If we take a look at the channel box, the cube has no rotation, and it's the it's the parent that has the rotation right there and you can see when we walk down the line each parent has uh, 36 more degree rotation so that does what well that allows me to say select all of the cubes and translate them according to their object space and move them and move them in and out towards their parents um, let's uh, and, then, and then of course I could take all of that duplicate it I'm sorry I'm sorry I said I meant to say group it and then duplicate it and now I have another set of instances that are independent oh that's right that's right I got I got, I got myself mixed up here so this row is an independent set of instances and this row is its own independent set of instances when I duplicate it with a standard control D if I want them all to be connected to the same box I would take this row, come up to the duplicate special option box, and I would instance the leaf node. I'm going to go to copy and check instance leaf node. Leaf node is a way of saying last child, so instance the last child. So I'm going to say have no degree in rotation, but I want to increase it on the y axis, say two units, but I only want one copy. And when I hit apply, now when I go to the face for the original cube, notice that they're all connected. So now all the cubes are connected. So the spiral is just uh, a, one more simple step added to everything that we've done already. And then I want to investigate smarter ways of using the instancing. So let's start with the spiraling part. So with the outliner visible here, um, I'll group the cube and I'll move the cube to the side and I'll just snap it to about a unit of five or six. The cube's going to be the step and the group is going to manage the step. The group's going to be like the center of the step that'll spin around like we did earlier. Now I'm going to use duplicate special and in here I've already set it up so that I'm going to instance. I'm going to increase my y-axis 1.25 units because my cube is one unit tall I want a 0.25 spacer from one step to the next. I'm going to rotate 18 degrees because I want to have a total of 20. So I've got one cube plus 19, that's 20, and then 20 divided into 360 is 18 degrees, or 2 divided into 36 is 18. So, and then drop the zeros. Uh, so uh, apply, and what we get is. Uh, cube that we can then further manipulate as we've seen earlier and all of the cubes will change accordingly so this is the beginnings of our spiraling step now what I'd like to do is make it even smarter just one more step smarter so this is good this would work but I've got something just a little bit better what I'd like to do is to have the ability to populate the instances that I've created with more objects, more geometry, even combine and do constructions within each instance and have that propagate to all the other instances. Well, to do that right now, it's impossible. So let's say I bring in this sphere and I want to attach it to this step. I can middle click, drag and drop the sphere and you're, you may logically be thinking, well, just drop it into group one and then it'll be a part of group one. But notice it doesn't propagate to the others. There's a very good reason for that. It's because they don't all share the same shape node. So if I were to say select sphere one here and look at what it's being shared. So I just hit this little uh, top level hierarchy button right here in the hypergraph connections. And actually that would be called hypergraph hierarchy. What I'm looking at right now is hypergraph hierarchy. And what you can see is that um, each, uh, each uh, uh, group is a parent which is referring to this cube and sphere uh, which are 
uh, being instanced across. The pink one means it's instanced. The gray means it's just by itself. So if I want this sphere to be a part of the instancing of the cube in a more automatic fashion, I need just one more step, one more thing to make that happen. And I'm pretty excited about this because I just discovered it. So what we're going to do is make the cube, we're going to group it, except this time we're going to group it twice. So now I've got two groups. The step, the group that's going to control the step, but it's actually going to, this group, the middle one, is going to be like the instance propagator, if you will. It's going to be the one that's going to allow connections to all the others. And then the group two is the one we're going to rotate around. So let's move group one, not the cube, but group one to the location where that we want the step select group two the top level group and then duplicate special this one and now what we get when we walk and open this up is we've got group two and group one notice that group one is the same in each one each group has a group one okay so when we go and take a look at the hypergraph hierarchy notice now that each group each subsequent group is looking at group one it's pointing at it I could make this even easier to understand, I think, when I just see it in action and use better naming. So let's see it in action first. So let's add a cylinder to the scene. And what I'm going to do is middle click, drag and drop, make a child, drag and drop this cylinder into group one, and notice how it propagates to all of the others. The, again, the reason for that is because each group, each new subsequent group, is pointing at group one. And that is instance. You can see it's in pink, purple, pink. That's instance. And then everything underneath that, the cylinder and so on, is instance. So I can easily add new items to the um, to, uh, uh, to the to the uh, instance of propagating across all of them. This is absolutely wonderful. Relatively new discovery for me. This is something I've wanted for a while, and I I don't know why it just took me this long to wrap my head around it. And I'm glad that it happened during these videos so that you can see it too and so that I can watch these videos myself and remember. And even and I even went a little further where I said, well, what if I want to do some merging and some combining and stuff like that? Well, it works just fine. So if I get the P cube cylinder and, 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 and combine them, mesh, combine, it does make these garbage objects in here. But if I just wipe out the um, right uh, uh, here, wipe out the uh, history, um, and then go here into and and then and then repopulate the poly surface back into group one. It propagates to all of them, and then I can safely trash these extra items that were created. And notice that the other groups are still clean. In other words, all they have are, is is the instance. All, all it has uh, are the instances. And then I could just as easily, um, you know, populate with with more. So if I want to make this cone a part of this as well just drag and drop that into group one and now I've got the cone or or, or the donut or or whatever um, and notice they all borrow their their parents um, transformations so what I also found was interesting is that I could say this pyramid let's add a pyramid if I added it to instead of the first group one but I added it to the last group one something odd happens it actually goes downward which I found very interesting. It actually goes the other direction, so it's it like takes its current starting point and like shifts everything down. So that's neat. Not kind of not really a bug. Not really bad. Um, just something to be aware of. Um, may be useful. Um, and if we again, if we take a look at the hypergraph uh, hierarchy, again everything uh, is pointing. All of those groups are pointing at these simple objects right here. And so really, uh, as far as Maya is concerned, it's these five objects that it's really managing. And all it has to do is uh, in its shape. And then for these groups, all it has to do is, is know what its transformations are. Where is it in space? How is it rotated? And how is it scaled? Pretty neat, huh? OK, so we're going to apply this stuff to making one of the spiraling uh, staircases. And we'll talk about that next. It could be any reference you want. I'll show you a couple of references that I grabbed.
Yeah, and I found one more thing to make this even a little bit better. Uh, one more step to add in all of this. So if I were to um, just hide this stuff and start up a new one, uh, what I found is during the instancing process, that I can actually use this feature right here called group under and check mark new group and in a sort of way what will happen is all the new stuff will be packed under a new group whereas these original ones will sit right here in the outliner and so this original one will act like the instance master well it is they're all the same really when they're instance but this will kinda look like the instance master and what happens is it makes it easier to manage the materials. So let me share that with you. So let me get my numbers in here again. And so you can see here I've got a new group with all of the new ones underneath it. Um, selecting all of them except the original. So as I make changes to the original one, uh, in particular material changes. So if I say uh, this one should have a new material and I change the color to something else notice something odd it didn't populate or propagate that material to the other instances well it it should have um, but what I found is that it makes it a little bit better to manage materials by simply selecting this new collection of all the instances groups that top level group and then right clicking on it and applying that existing material and now they all get it so now I can safely make changes to the material and all of the instances will receive those changes now because now they're all borrowing from the same material node so I hope that cl clarifies that so as I make changes like uh, this cylinder for example and I drag and drop it onto this group um, when I apply materials to the group um it's only going to apply it to the uh, to that first one inside this uh setup. That's the only downside I've found to this is that it has this little extra bit, but applying it to the base group, if you will, um that seems to override it just fine. Well, and hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier for you when you're managing your materials. So Let's see how this is going to work in, in the next section, making the staircase. So one more thing needs to be said about this strategy of doing a double group of an object for the instancing process. Again, to reiterate what it is that I mean, um, I'm going to take this cube, group it twice, and the, the whole reason for that was so that this second group, the, wo uh, the one in, in between, becomes a part of the instance. So when I instance this a few times, notice that the when we add a cone to it, for example, and I know we just did this, but I'm, I'm just being clear. When I middle click, drag and drop this cone into group one, which is part of the instance, the instance, it will then propagate to all of the others. And you can see each of the others has received that cone as a part of its instance, as a part of that shape. And again, let's look at the hypergraph uh, connections or hypergraph hierarchy. Let's look at that. And we can see that the group is indeed part of the instance because it has highlighted it in pink. And the cube and cone are children underneath it, which are part of the same shape. And each of the uh, subsequent groups for the instances are pointing at group one and anything that's underneath group one, which is why I'm able to populate group one with new geometry and do modeling on the fly within the instance. So this had presented problems with material, which is why in this last video we took this strategy and let's get this going again. So we double group this up again, which is why we use this strategy to take all of the new uh, instances and pack them into this new group. So now we have a way of managing all of the instances in addition to the master group. So let's call this first one the master. 
So when we add the uh, cone to the other uh, to the group one and they all get populated with it. If I then add a material to group two, so we'll just highlight group two, add a material to it, and a new one, and we do that and we make it maybe red. It doesn't populate to all the other instances, but we can then quickly and easily grab this collection group, if you will, and apply that existing material to it. Okay? So now the question is, how do I come back to an object? So I knew from experience that I could take any instance that I've created and convert it back to an object, and that's in the, the standard convert menu. And I've torn it off here for you. And at the bottom of the list is the instance to object conversion. So what I found is that there are actually some problems, minor, but minor enough to be very annoying, um, that if you try to actually uh, inst try to convert back the instance by selecting the group one it actually won't do anything actually it'll make a bunch of garbage so if we take a look at this it ends up doing this sort of double grouping and then uh, in this case everything got wiped out it really uh, seems to be a problem so what I found is that it's better and easier and much more predictable to convert the transformation object, which is going to be, again, taking a look at the hypergraph hierarchy, which is going to be one of these objects, these, the, the one that was um, essentially was the, the duplicate copy of the group two. So if we use instance to object for that, we get a perfect conversion. It gets sent to the bottom of the list because it's the most recently created one. And on top of that, we can select any face on it and notice that it is indeed independent, whereas these are still all, all connected. So when I get to the plant life and the grape and such, when I want to individuate um, the instancing, I'm going to use the instance to object conversion, and I'm going to convert from this transform group and not the actual instance group. In other words, I'm not going to run the conversion on the pink ones. I'm going to run the conversion on the top level one. So if all of this seems far too confusing for you, you can abandon this. It really isn't necessary. Uh, I'm sorry to say that I'm actually being terribly clever by doing all of this stuff. And um, in the end, it's just as well that you can make, say, this plane, and we're going to texture a leaf to this plane, and you want to have um, instances of this plane, so you just simply move the pivot point to where you want it to be, and then uh, duplicate that and now you've got a second leaf or we could instance it and in the parent space and have several instances of this thing um, something like that and they're all still connected so we can still make changes and it'll propagate to all the others and it's simple enough to take that one object and hit instance to object it gets sent to the bottom of the list because it's the most recently created and we have individuated this object from all the others and it's super fast and easy because what what you click is what you're going to get so just keep that in mind I wanted to be very transparent on how useful I think the double grouping method is but how it can also cause complications towards the end of the process when you're trying to finish so there it is Alright, so here are some of the images that I've grabbed from Google. I don't have a spiraling staircase in my house, uh, nor do I have any photographs of one, nor do I have any idea right now of where I could find one. Um, so I resorted to using Google and managed to find some basic plan uh, imagery of how to build a spiraling staircase. So I've taken a lot of time to figure out how these things work, and I think I've got a pretty good plan on how to move forward on this. Um, taking advantage of everything that we've discussed prior. So this is the spiraling staircase I've chosen to make and I'm gonna use this plan right here to help with uh, our creation creative process. Um, really important numbers here to take note of are that each step is about a 30 degrees of the entire 360 degree rotation and that the entire diameter of it is going to be, um, in this image, is 160. I'm going to make mine 120. 
uh, because I think that this staircase is uh, more attractive on, on a narrower base, so it's narrow and tall. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret this number here, 86. That might be the, the width of the opening at the top. I couldn't quite figure that out, so I'll just ignore that number for now. And another thing is that there are 12 steps plus the 13th, which is the second floor. So taking a look at the photograph, we've got 12 steps if you count them all the way up, plus the 13th, which is going to be the second floor. And a couple other things to note about this image is that the first step is actually elevated off the ground and the pipe that connects to it is the same length from the bottom of this pipe to the top this um, for this uh, support for the handrail and so each pipe for each step is the same length all the way up and I'm going to assume it's the same at the top here as well if we get to that another thing to know is that the spiral the step itself is wood all the way through to the back end, uh, through the column, so it's aluminum and then wood, aluminum, wood, aluminum, wood. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to achieve that. And another thing to see is that we've got five wires as a barrier, so we'll have uh, a, a need for that. Uh, another thing to note is that the corners of the steps are rounded. Another thing is that the handrail wood extrusion is kind of jut out a little bit here at the beginning and jut out a little bit at the end. Um, another thing to note is that the handrail is slightly square in shape, rectangular in profile, um, not round. Um, and I'll show you the differences between round and square and the problems uh, and, and ways of solving that. Um, so since we have these plans, uh, I've taken the time to figure out um, how, how, what's the best way to approach this and, and, and now that I have this sort of schematic I have these numbers to work with so I'm going to use NURB surfaces initially to get this started and then I'm going to migrate my way over to polygons another image here that's really useful is this one right here this is, this is the rise this is the space between um, the first step to the second step and, and in this illustration it's anywhere between 21 and 23 centimeters it can be whatever really we want it to be but that seems to be an attractive and functional um, riser. And we'll look at Maya right away. First thing we'll look at in Maya is to make sure that Maya is set up to reference uh, centimeters and, uh, and what you need to do to find that information. There are a couple other images here that are worth looking at that I grabbed that I thought were interesting. Um, each of them have slightly different challenges in them. And I also saved for you an HTML page which takes you to this company in Britain that uh, sells uh, modular spiraling staircases which happen to have these um, excellent reference plans to it. So credit to them. Um, and uh, if you're in the UK, I suppose, you can take a look at what their products do. They only ship to, the, they only ship to uh, people in Britain. And to be clear on um, where I've been building these things. I think I've gone through this about 20 different times at least trying to figure out the best practices for making this spiraling staircase and you need to know that in my first attempts I tried to do this with polygons. I tried to do it with boxes. I tried to work with cylinders. I tried dividing up the cylinders and it never. I was never completely satisfied with the results so that's why I'm going to begin with NURBS and work my way towards polygons from there. Let's take a look at Maya and see what we need to do to change the settings. Okay, so the very first thing I want to show you in Maya is that here underneath File, New Scene, Option Box, you can change the default unit uh, from millimeter to centimeter to meter, inch, foot, yard, or yard. And uh, the default is centimeter, so every time you open up a new scene, it's going to be set to centimeter. And the reason for that is that here's the global setting underneath Window, settings and preferences preferences and underneath the settings right here you can change that to to affect every new scene you create as well as the angle in your FPS as well as the up axis so uh, which is useful for mocap um, so here's where you make those global changes another thing to pay attention to is underneath the display menu grid and then the option box for the grid and in here we can change the number of units that we can see in the unit is an abstract uh, way to 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 tell you is this uh, uh, centimeters or yards or feet. So when we look at this grid here in the perspective view, one of these squares is one unit, and that unit is defined by 
the option box uh, in your new scene. That so that one unit is one centimeter. So that means it's going to take a uh, hundred centimeters to make a meter. Or if you're having trouble with conversions, you can go to this website here that I go to all the time. It's just this free little utility. I think there's even a, an app for this for your phones. Um, where you can do popular length conversions and such and all common lengths or all lengths and uh, do some quick uh, uh, setup so you know we're looking at one one uh, centimeter converting to one meter is actually point zero one meters so uh, ten of course you just move the decimal point and then a hundred uh, again move the decimal point and we've got one meter so a hundred centimeters is going to equal a meter so you know that gives you some sense of real world measurements so when you're looking at this grid as far as um, Maya is concerned this is actually a tiny little portion of space um, that would explain why it is that some values when you're editing in the channel box are just so difficult to control it's because our objects are actually really tiny so I'm gonna build this stairwell at one-tenth of the scale of the original one so you know our default grid is 12 units I'm gonna have the full diameter of this stairwell at 120 units but I want to I want to keep it at a smaller scale and then when I'm all done I can bring it up to full scale if I need to another thing I'd like to do is mark off um, the the uh, the units uh, for every five so I can start seeing things in terms of ten um, so every every yellow block is going to be a set of 10 so that gives me one uh, decimeter uh, so uh, or, or, or 10 centimeters another thing I can do is check these little bullets right here for perspective grid numbers and orthographic grid numbers so that allows you to see the numbers in perspective view and in the orthographic views which could be very very useful for you especially if you're working from plans I can actually going to um, hide them I'll just hide them in the perspective view because they they tend to get in visually get in the way, um, but I do like them in the orthographic view. So that information is right here in the grid option. So you can just apply and close that and keep these. Let's take one more look at the grid options and uh, get a, a much more clear explanation of how these things work. So the length width gr uh, grid units is just how how much is displayed in the viewport. So that's pretty simple. That's just how many centimeters are we seeing so we're seeing a total of 20 centimeters now if we were to change that value to one and change the grid lines to one and we change the subdivisions to 10 now we're looking at one centimeter wide grid and the 10 divisions would be your millimeters so that should be pretty straightforward that's just obviously it's just way too dense I think in the orthographic views it's very difficult to see that um, so let's change the total display to 20 and let's say now that we know that the grid lines of uh, one unit means one centimeter and when we divide it 10 times we're looking at the millimeters particularly in this perspective viewport it's easier to see um, so when we say show me every five all we're doing is simplifying it in the view which makes it easier to see excuse me which makes it easier to see in the orthographic views so when you're div the, the divisions is a way to cut the um, centimeters up so when we say divide five a five unit block by five now we're looking at every centimeter so if we wanted to see every millimeter in this case we would have to say 50 divisions so now we're seeing blocks of five centimeters in every millimeter in between and so that's just again that's just way too confusing I think it's easier to keep to simplify this so that your grid lines and your subdivisions are the same um, same number so we're looking at blocks of five by five centimeters and if you need something smaller than that you can go into subdivisions if something smaller that you can snap to you can go into subdivisions and display that uh, here so that should help clarify exactly how those units are being used